Hello, everybody. Welcome to Broadway.com's Live at Five. It is Monday. Hi, Andy. It's Monday. Hey. It's Monday, May 20th. I'm Beth Stevens. I'm Andy Lefkowitz. And we are here with Caitlin Moynihan. Hello. And I'm very excited about our yes. guest today. We have Tony nominee, Dominique Morisot, Woo. who wrote the book for Ain't Too Proud. What is it? The Life and Times of the Temptations. Yes, full Broadway title. hit. <laughs> Broadway hit. We will get to that, but first, our, our top five. This actress is making her return to Broadway in this revival play that's hitting the boards next season. Yeah, so this is pretty cool news. Marissa Tomei, Oscar winner, Broadway veteran, is coming back to the stage uh, this fall in a new production of Tennessee Williams' 1951 play, The Rose Tattoo. Uh, this will be a production of Roundabout Theatre Company at the American Airlines Theatre, uh, directed by Trip Coleman, who most recently directed Choir Boy, which is nominated for Best Play this season on Broadway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, performances will kick off on September 19th and open on October 15th. Uh, Marissa Tomei is going to play the role of Serafina, and she's a widow who rekindles her desire for love in the arms of a fiery suitor. Ooh. Be the, you said that so calmly. Right? A fiery, fiery, fiery suitor. suitor. <laughs> yes. Um, as we all know, Marissa Tomei won an Oscar for My Cousin Vinny. She was also nominated for In the Bedroom and The Wrestler. And uh, most recently, she was on Broadway in The Realistic Joneses. So I'm very excited to see her back on Broadway. Yes. Another day, another list of people congr to congratulate for becoming award winners. The Cheetah Rivera Awards were just announced this weekend, yes. and now they honor dance and choreography, and let me get to it because I've got some exciting names to read and, and productions. Winners of note include the Company of King Kong, because, you know, there's a lot of choreography in King Kong, <laughs> uh, for outstanding ensemble in a Broadway show. Uh, from Sykes... Of Ain't Too Proud, yes. The Life and Times of the Temptations, mm -hmm. one for his Broadway performance, and for the female, they, they divide up male and female, so it was a tie. Are you aware of this tie? Yes, You're aware. totally. Ashley Blair Fitzgerald for The Share Show. She plays the Dark Lady, the big dance number in that uh, show, and Gabrielle Hamilton, who is the lead dancer in Oklahoma, who does the Dream, Incredible. Baby Dream, oh my goodness. Ballet reimagined let me put it that way Hades Towns choreographer David Newman won for choreography of a Broadway show Smokey Joe's earned the off-Broadway prize for outstanding ensemble um, Alice by Hearts Rick and Jeff Cooperman took a home the off-Broadway prize for choreography Wes Taylor took it home for outstanding male dancer for that off-Broadway show the whole list is on Broadway.com check it out it yes. used to be called the Astaire Award but now we've updated things for Chita Rivera I just like to say her name Three stage favorites are getting together for a one night only concert. Oh my goodness. This is, this a good is going thing. to be epic. Okay, yeah. so we found out today that Jason Robert Brown, who is doing a residency at the downtown venue Subculture, will celebrate his 50th performance in that residency with a special one night benefit concert. He'll be joined by Stephen Sondheim and Katrina Lane. Wait, wait, wait. You said that too fast. Yeah. Stephen. Sondheim. Pause. Sondheim. Yes. Breath. <laughs> Breath. Go on. <laughs> and, and of course, Tony winner Katrina Lank, who won a Tony last season for the band's visit. Uh, this will be a uh, benefit for the Brady Foundation, which um, works to um, uh, reduce gun violence. So it's a gun violence protect protection organization. The event will happen on June 24th at 8 p.m. at New York City's Town Hall. I'm available if you want to take me. As I game. know, right? Seriously. Um, this will be the second time that Subculture does a benefit for the Brady organization. Uh, the last time was in 2016, where there was a one-night sold-out concert of the last five years starring Cynthia Erivo and Joshua Henry. So this night should be just as epic. Tickets go on sale tomorrow, I think, so make your plans. I'm making them. Yeah. And full casting has been announced for this West End debut. So there's a West End debut of a new David Mamet play called Bitter Wheat. I'm saying it with a British-style accent for you all. <laughs> it stars John Malkovich, who has not been in the West End in, what, around 30 years or yes. so. And it has been speculated that this character that John Malkovich plays is based on Harvey Weinstein. So there's a lot of material there to work with. Uh, but here are the new <laughs> cast members. A Alexander Arnold, Teddy Kempner, Matthew Pigeon, and Zephyrin Tate, who has a very cool name, have joined the previously announced Malkovich, Dune McKinnon, McKicken, and Iona 
Kimbrook. This opens on June 19th at the Garrick Theater. Stars performances on June 7th. So there you go. Oh, go. there's more. There's yeah. more. Oh we have gosh. more news. Go ahead. Yes, yes, we do have more news. Yeah. And today we honored uh, a Broadway extraordinaire general manager. Yes, so Ellen Wasser, um, a legendary general manager of Broadway, uh, was honored today with a memorial service at the Majestic Theater. And tonight, Broadway marquees will dim in his honor. Um, in, uh, among his illustrious career, uh, Ellen Wasser general managed the original productions of Les Miserables, Phantom, which is still running, and Miss Saigon. Uh, so uh, keep your eyes. The big three. The big three. Big three. So, um, like I said, uh, marquee lights will be dimmed tonight in his memory. Alan Wasser was honored in 2017 with a special Tony honor for the for excellence in theater. Hmm. So, um, you know, hats off to him and um, support and love to his family. Mm -hmm. We have a few more things on the site that you yeah. all need to check out. We have exclusive photos from the Drama League luncheon that happened on Friday with 53 nominees, a lot. Yeah. And, of course, some productions were honored, and Brian Cranston took home the Most Distinguished Performance Award. But we have great photos of some people who are in different shows getting together and just, just cool stuff there. And we also have photos of the Cheetah Rivera Awards yes. because dancing, got to take pictures. So there you go. Check that out. Andy, thank you. You bet. Thanks for having me. Caitlin, will you tell us a little bit more about our guest? Gladly. Yes, we have fresh Tony nominee Dominique Mariso here with us in the studio today because she just earned her first Tony Award nomination for Best Book and Ain't Too Proud, hyphen the life and times of The Temptations. We got to do the full title here. Uh, this marks her Broadway debut, and the show earned 12 Tony nominations, including Best Musical. So... Real good. Um, in 2018, she earned the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, so we are extremely lucky to have her here today. Uh, please follow her on Instagram at Do Mariso. It rhymes. <laughs> follow it. Uh, and please leave all of your questions in the comments below. Please welcome Dominique and Beth. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, Dominique. Hi, Beth. How are you? I'm thrilled to be sitting next to you. So my first question is the most important one, is 12. Now your lucky number because mm -hmm. you have 12 Tony nominations mm -hmm. for Ain't Too Proud. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it feels good for us because it's a team effort. And it I, and our show sort of has that mantra about team and, and the group being more important than the individual. And so oh, yeah. it sort of feels like, yep, that's right. That's, that's what we're supposed yeah. to do. Honoring everybody. Yeah, that's right. That's great. Well, it's such a fun show. And everybody kind of knows the Temptations music, but maybe not the story behind it. So yeah. as you were digging in, I know that Otis Williams, whose character mm -hmm. in the show, wrote a, um, a memoir in 1988. I assume you used that a lot. Uh, I used it. I used different anecdotes from it, you know. The, the movie that they did in the 90s uh, with the, on VH1 for The Temptations also used the book. Mm -hmm. So I sort of used what I felt was different than what was in the movie. I tried to find those excerpts that I, I wanted to know a little bit more about. Because he was sort of, um, so many members of The Temptations were still alive when he wrote that memoir. Mm -hmm. And that he's now the last one standing. And I think with his age and just with time and, and with being sort of like the, the only living member to tell the story, I think he was a lot more bold and free this time around. And so we got to the bottom of some things that maybe he was a little safer and more protective with uh, years ago. Well, you are known from being from the great city of Detroit. Yes. So there must be an incredible sense of responsibility for you because the people of Detroit will let you know how they feel about the temptation. Oh, yes, they will. They will to ad nauseum. I will get, <laughs> you know, e things in my inbox. And I'm like, lady, I didn't even choreograph this. Like, why are you coming for me for the crowd? <laughs> you know, um, they just want to make sure everything is the way that they think it ought to be. Right, because they feel an ownership for totally. some of these Motown groups and especially the temptations which with their longevity. That's right. And because, you know, so many Detroiters, I mean, it's not just like, oh, we, this city made this group in terms of like the music industry, but they like our neighbors. I went to school yeah. with these people, you know, I mean, it's, it's that kind of history. So it's you're really dealing with their direct lineage. Um, but I think that we satisfied that because I, Detroit had to be a character in the story for me. It's not just the backdrop, you know, it's not just this, you know, this is where they are from. Right. This is who made them um, what they were. And, and I think that that has to be integral so that when, even when we're dealing with like social unrest in the story, it, it goes back to Detroit at some point with that social unrest as well. Um, just because 
I can't even imagine what it's like to, right now, I'm in New York, I live in LA, I'm, I'm always outside of Detroit doing the work that I do. I can't imagine while I'm here being visible in this moment that something, you know, that my city could be under a fire, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I don't know what that would even feel like and I was trying to imagine what that would feel like for the Temptations. You've explored Detroit a lot in your work. What is it about the city? I know it's your home, but what is it about the city that continues to feed your imagination? You know, I think it's, um, I just, first of all, I think it's gotten a very limited, uh, you know, narrative painted mm -hmm. about it for a very long time. And so it sort of became a part of my journey in, in discovering myself outside of the media narrative about who we were. And so it, at first, it's just an exploration of me and my own history. I mean, I have about 250, 300 family members in Detroit. So when wow. you're talking about Detroit, you are literally talking about my family, <laughs> you know? And so I wanted to understand our evolution. Um, and I think understanding that, understanding the, the way the city sits in juxtaposition to the rest of the nation and what, how, what kind of metaphor it becomes for the nation, it just, all of those things compel me because I think when you, um, it's like these forgotten cities or these mm -hmm. cities that people write off with urban blight, you know, it's sort of in a way, strangely, um, kind of reminds me of the way that we talk about Appalachia, you know, yeah. um, it's just this, like, it's almost like it, these places that are considered places that have gone into complete ruin as if the humanity there has also gone into ruin. Right. And that's not true. Right. That's they're, not not not, right. Not, they're, they're not abandoned there. places. They're people there. They're not abandoned places. They're people there. And I, 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 it just, it always disturbs me no matter where I am actually. When I first moved to New York, I moved to Bed-Stuy. And the way people would talk about Bed-Stuy, mm -hmm. which has been my home of New York for 15 plus years, they would talk about Bed-Stuy in a way that, that similar way. And, um, and I would just think, but there's kids here. Like, people are growing and living here. Mm -hmm. Like, how can you write these places off? And in fact, now those places are being overly heavily gentrified and people sure. are setting up shop there. So there's something there that's, yeah. that's magic or all those people wouldn't be coming. So what compelled you as you're writing Ain't Too Proud? What kept you going? What really interested you about this story? And how did you find the structure for it because it's a huge epic tale there are yeah. five leads plus all of the kind of replacement kind of situations yeah. happening yeah how did you stick to it oh that was hard <laughs> <laughs> um it was and it wasn't I let the story guide me like their journey as a group I mean that'll do half the job for you because mm -hmm. they literally did live through. You know, I was, I was talking earlier, um, uh, actually to Playbill, and we were, I was talking about the journey of the first act to the second act. You know, we bring once we bring David Ruffin into the story, yeah. you know, it's like it's like once you bring David Ruffin into the group, like the group goes up. You mm -hmm. know, and so then when we take David Ruffin out of this, what's seemingly out of the story, we take him out of the group because that's what happened. It's like, well, what are we going to do? Do we lose our show now? Or what are we right. going to do? Right, yeah, there's got to keep the energy you up keep and that the energy interest. Up. But you're like, well, the group kept going after David Ruffin mm -hmm. left, so there must be something here. Right. And, and, and we found it. So I think half of the storytelling is in, um, in their journey, and the other half of the story structure is in our performers themselves, you know. from uh, the, the three guys that play our lead temptations are Jarvis B. Manning. He plays Al. Mm -hmm. And then Ephraim Sykes, who plays David Ruffin, that replaces Al. And then uh, St. Auburn, who plays Dennis Edwards, that replaces David Ruffin. And each of these three guys are like, just show, showmen, you know? I mean, yeah. they have their own amazing, like, performance skill, and they always keep that ball up in the air. So that was, for me, part of the structure in how do we tell this story of this group that keeps going is on the bodies of these amazing men who are these brilliant performers. Um, but the other half, I think, is also using the music to tell the story. Uh, their songs get more and more political as they, you know, they change sound mm -hmm. after, you know, from the 60s to the 70s. The focus that was in the 60s on, you know, just being um, ballads that made them hot. It started to get into this like funk, funk, oh, yeah. funkadelic era, you know, and psychedelic era, and then the the world was you know, the war was happening, and and music was getting more political. So you can sort of tell the story of American music and the story of this group through the time, and through their own journey in the music. So that helped us with the structure. I was like, I was looking at it like, wow, this. 
this almost wrote itself because their music just happens to keep working with everything else in the story. It keeps working with the actors and the group members and taking them out and bringing them back in. It just it just works. And where it didn't, you know, we broke the rules of the music. You know, yeah. we bring uh, Ephraim Sykes back on right away, actually. And, and when you think he's out of this play, he's right back in there taking over another song. You know, so we, we found those ways. As you were creating this show. What did you look, besides the stories of the, of the Temptations, what were you looking to in terms of musical theater for structure or for inspiration? You know, I did not look at what may be considered like your, your jukebox. You right, know? yeah. I know that that's, um, I mean, I honestly did not know what weight that word carried. And it sound, always sounded like a dirty word when people would say <laughs> it. Uh, but I don't know. I don't have any association with that being positive or negative. But I, I grew up on um, musicals. I was in high school. I used to do musicals. I did a chorus line when I was in high school. I did. I was. Um, You're a performer. So I was what Christine else did you do? and the chorus line. <laughs> and um, and I literally actually am not the best singer. So I had the song I really can't sing, <laughs> and it was perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I was in Once on This Island in high school. And that's, mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite musicals growing up. And Dream Girls, you know, mm -hmm. um, Sweeney Todd. And, and all great stories. Yeah, all great stories. And and you know, Little Shop of Horrors. Those are oh, like yeah. my things, right? And um, and so for me, I sort of, especially with the Dream Girls model, I tried mm -hmm. to just remember what big things happen at these in these act breaks and those mm -hmm. kind of things to to teach me musically what needs to happen with story. Uh, but then I also just I have a I'm a I'm a musical writer in plays. You're, there's so anyway. much music in your work. Yeah. So Always. it feels organic, frankly, to me to just I, I feel like I understand what all stories need when they get to that, you know, that middle point. You want to know what's going to happen next and you want to feel it emotionally. You want the music to connect to it. Like, it just makes sense to me. It doesn't, that is not the part that I felt like, gee, how am I going to do this yeah. coming from playwriting? That's the part that I was like, okay, so I get that. How do you do this other stuff? <laughs> you know? Um, and, and yeah, that was, it was a journey. Des McEnough, who's our director, mm -hmm. was really a, a great person to do this with. Because he he's been around, he's been at the rodeo a few times. Yeah, you know, I had the I, I'm very privileged, and I get to interview lots of people, and I got yeah. to interview Des, and he said, "Well, this story is about entrances and exits, and that's what we do." In that's the right. Theater. That's right. And when he said that, it just clicked to me, like, oh, so I mean, I actually feel like I wrote to Des's vision. You know, he wow. told me that he wanted a turntable and he wanted a treadmill, and I go, oh, okay, so I can make David fly, slide on out. <laughs> I can make somebody slide on in. Okay, that's fun. Let's do that, you know? And um, and so him give, having that clarity ahead of time actually gave me some fun parameters to create within. Now, I know you guys have questions, and we will get to them in a second, but I have, to, I have one more for you. Walk me through what it feels like to get a MacArthur Genius Grant. Just walk me through... <laughs> Getting that call or however it works where you're like, I'm a certified <laughs> genius. I want to know. A funny thing is that that came at a time when I was sort of like in a very heavy, overwhelmed workspace. So I wasn't taking calls. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, the machine is on. You know, I had my assistant, you know, sort of like blocking these, you know, <laughs> protecting me so I could work, you know. And so we kept getting, I kept getting this call on my cell phone that I did not recognize. And I'm like, who is this calling me, you know? And I, um, I would, I would have her like check, like look, check, look, do some email, like find, find where this person has, like how do I know this person? Because they are like telling me I, you need to call me back immediately, and I'm like I don't know this person. <laughs> I'm not calling them back immediately. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and eventually it just it got a little ridiculous through the day that I was, you know, at, at a certain point they had to say, Dominique, you seriously need to reach out and call us back. And I was like, is this a, this happened to me once before with the Kennedy Prize. And I oh. started thinking like, this could be connected to something important that I'm not aware of. It must be a secret, you know. So <laughs> I finally did call back and they were like, hi. <laughs> like, um, we're trying to give you an award, you know. <laughs> and I was like, I am so sorry. Uh, so that was magic, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that my favorite thing about that award is that it takes like, like 40 people in your industry to like yeah, it's your peers, for them right? to talk to, for them to decide that you are, you know, going to get granted this award. So mm -hmm. I'm like, wow. Every time that it comes from my peers, they're, they're like sanctioning of me or co-signing me. I just, there's nothing better than that feeling right That's there. That's what the Tony Awards are as well. Yeah, yeah. It's special. But you can lord over your family that you're a genius. Yes, that must brother, come in handy. I would love for him to keep calling me that. Um, <laughs> he will not give that up. But I'm like, you have to. It's like it's official. Yeah, 
like stamped. It's official. I don't know. Little brothers, they'll never ever do what they're supposed to. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right, Caitlin, let's take some questions from our viewers. Yes. So Alec asks, what is the most surprising thing that you learned about either Otis or the group itself as while you were creating the story? Oh, uh, I think realizing what it meant to Otis to still be alive and to still be doing this work, you know, mm -hmm. I thought he was so um, gracious, but he got really emotional when I asked him, you know, how's it feel to be the last man standing? And uh, and I it, that told me a lot. And what his what his son and what that loss meant to him. And it just, uh, the realization that no matter what you do as an artist, we all pay a cost to get to the things that we have to do. And no one ever knows the cost, but if you're gonna love an artist, you gotta love them whole. Mm -hmm. You gotta love everything that they, you gotta know what they went through to really appreciate the art that they are giving you. And so for me, I was like, wow, that's something that you never, he's never gonna recover from. And his, his art will always be the thing that helps him cope with a loss. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. So Jake wants to know, how did you go about fitting in their musical catalog into telling their story and using it to help push the story forward instead of just having it be a yeah. moment? How, how, how was that decision making? You know, that was the fun part for me because I like listening to music. You know, I'm married to a musician. My husband, um, his name is Jay Keys, and he's a music artist. He's a hip-hop artist. And so I, I love listening to music, interpreting it and saying, oh, I think this means something else. I don't think oh. this means what we think mm. it means. You know, so I got <laughs> to do that with, you know, a lot of the Temptation songs where I could say, I think this is actually a, a story song mm -hmm. or I think this is really thematic. I think this is not a song about a man to a woman. This is men to men right now. These are brothers singing to each other, or this is a, a man singing to his nation. And that's how I think I was able to find ways to help their, their music also be part of the story. I love that. Yeah. Now, you've had a lot of people that want to see this show, but recently Oprah came. <laughs> I'm just going to ask because it's Oprah. What was that like for you last week? Uh, yo, Oprah jumped up and down when she came backstage. <laughs> like I saw Oprah lift off the ground. Do you know what I mean? So there, that was special. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get that one again in my lifetime. Um, but it was it was great. She put us on her Instagram. You know, when yeah. you get the O of approval, it just sort of makes. It doesn't really matter what else I'm doing, but to the people at home. And to your family, when a celebrity, you know, especially one of Oprah's magnitude, mm -hmm. knights you, it's sort of, that's all, you doesn't, the genius grant is forgotten. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but Oprah though, you know, uh, so I guess I'm just happy to have her award now. <laughs> I just want to make a suggestion to you that if she calls you, take the call. Just take it. <laughs> Just pick it up. Too. I mean, I got to know her number. You know, I don't know. It's right, these strangers cheeky. calling yourself. Strangers. I just, I don't know what's happening. I think bill collectors, I don't know. I'm, I'm Could be anybody. not to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Here. So this will be the last question. So Mary says that you've talked a lot about, you know, this being a group work, but how does your individual nomination for your book and earning that Tony nomination, how did, how did you feel? What was your, that moment for you like? Uh, this is going to be a little strange. But I was not thinking of me, and I know that sounds like whatever it sounds like. <laughs> but my concern was for my cast. And I, I really was, I mean, my, my, um, my mentee, her name is Story Air, she can testify to this because she was with me. And she was like, hey, guess what? You got, you got 12, you know? <laughs> because the day before, my friend called me. She had read one of those prediction ones yeah, and we don't thought know it was the real that. thing. She thought it was oh, the real oh, thing. Oh, no. And we had three. Oh, no. <laughs> and I wasn't mentioned. And I was like, I don't care. But I was really mad <laughs> that someone like Derek Baskin wasn't in her that prediction. But I thought it was real. And oh, so I, I was a little sad and gotten used to like, all right, whatever. We take what we get and mm -hmm. we'll just roll with it. And then later on that day, I was like, hey, Michelle, I think you were reading a prediction site. I got to go through this all <laughs> over again tomorrow. You know what I mean? <laughs> So then the next day came, and I was like, so when finally they said 12, I was like, but what about Derek? Because, <laughs> like, that has stressed me out the day before. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I actually felt, like, relieved that the cast, because I feel like, I do feel like it's a, it's a nod to me as a writer mm -hmm. when these people that I wrote these, what I think are Tony Award winning roles, yeah. mm -hmm. get nominated. I feel like I did my job as the writer. So getting nominated myself is like, oh, that's, that's extra. That's a little icing that Love feels it. real good. 
Thank you for coming, Dominique. And Thank congratulations you. Thank you. on your Oprah Award and your Tony <laughs> nomination and being a certified genius and all the things. There will be the Oprah Award. There will be. I, I guarantee Absolutely. You. And I'm sure you'll get one. <laughs> Caitlin, will you take us on out? Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. We are live at 5 every single weekday. Uh, be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast by searching for hashtag live at 5 and hitting that subscribe button. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. We talk to Tony nominee Kelly O'Hara all about Kiss Me Kate.